have come together to be comforted by the Word of God after an eventful week. We are here to express, first of all, that we are not doing this in our own strength, but our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. With that confession, we can continue. As I invite you to sing with me Psalm 121, the senses 1, 2, 3, and 4. At this time, it is good to have the experience of the power of prayer. Let us pray for the Lord to guide us in this afternoon. God of glory, God of mercy, at this time, on this day, 
When the week concludes, we must come to the conclusion that we must turn to you. You've taught us to sing that you will fail us never, and we are in need of comfort, of understanding, of insight. We confess that we do not have in ourselves what it takes to come to terms with what happened that Monday morning when so sudden, so unexpected, you brought home your child, Brian van Dijk. We need your help, Lord. We turn to you and we ask humbly, speak to us. Not only are we filled with grief and sorrow, we are also ready to listen. Show us the way, Lord, as we find ourselves with an empty spot in our home, our family, our school community, our church community, and the wider community. We thank you that at this time we can turn to you. And we come to you with our request for comfort and mercy, for light and joy. Will you direct us by your word so that we not only look back on what happened, but also look forward to what is still to come. For all this, we turn to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. I'd like you to turn with me to the Word of God. It's we should have access to a Bible right in front of you. And I'd like to read with you Psalm 103. It is the psalm of the great contrast between who God is and who we are. Let's read about that when we read of David. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us, according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field, for the wind passes over it, and it's gone. And its place knows it no more. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him 
and his righteousness to children's children to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, O you his angels, you mighty ones, who do his words, obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all his hosts, his ministers who do his will. Bless the Lord, all his works, in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Let us now sing of the same. Psalm 103, the stanzas 5 and 6. over the past week, the family has been busy with the Word of God and it seemed to concentrate on Romans 8. So out of that chapter, I've chosen the text as for the message, Romans 8 verse 28. There we read, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Dear brother and sister Ben and Faye, Lewis and Megan, Maria and Mary, Sebastian and Colleen, Marley, nieces and nephews, dear family, friends, brothers and sisters, congregation. When in the early hours of Monday, 
March 25, 2024, my phone rang. I did not expect that the days thereafter would be so different. Through his tears, I heard his brother say, my brother just died. And I had to double check if I'd heard it well. And from that moment on, it seemed to me that time stood still. When I walked into your home, nothing felt real. And I'm thinking that your brain stopped and that your feelings froze and only your breath kept going in and out. Yes, we're here. But likely you still don't completely realize what happened. For what can you say? Was this the will of the Lord? All things being in his hand and nothing happening by chance and all that? Or was this the evil one? Was this something we did wrong? The questions that we all had left a ripple effect from your home to your family, to your extended family, to the school community, to the church community, to the wider community, all kinds of questions. Not one question has not gone through your mind. But it is so sudden, it hits, and it is irreversible. It came so close. What am I saying? It came too close. Brian Timothy Van Dyke. The quiet Brian. Till he found his voice in teaching what he loved. The calm Brian, till he found his passion. The silent Brian, till he could show how intelligent and articulate he was. We all have had our own experiences. To some, he was a member of the Van Dyck family. To others, he was a quiet single man. To some, he was just that dedicated teacher. To others, he was a loyal friend and a confidant. And now we're all trying to make sense of what happened. Is this the way it had to go? Sure, we know that Psalm 103 says, as far uh, man, for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field. The wind passes over it and it's gone and its place knows it no more. But is that the lesson of the sudden death of Brian Timothy Van Dyck? Are we to learn that our frame is just but fragile? and that our days are like grass? Or is this the lesson that we say, like one who lost his children suddenly too? The Lord gave, the Lord has taken away. You know, that was Job. Is that the way to talk about it? Let's be honest. We don't know. We don't know what to say, especially when we take that angle. But what we do know is this, that the Lord did not lose control in that very moment. He was there when no one was around. 
Now we confess that the Lord is always present, but now we are perhaps even more troubled. Is he, if he's always present, do we then have to say, well, the Lord gave and the Lord take away, took away? Or do we have to conclude that it was fatal because it was fate? I know that we can keep on asking. We can go on forever with our questions. And we may do so. For the Lord is not deaf to our questions. He listens to his children. Of this we can be sure. Perhaps he doesn't give the answers right away. But what he does tell us is that we can trust him. Because this is not just about the Lord God being present all the time. This is also about the Lord God being all powerful. That's why the Apostle Paul says that in the text, what we've read, that he says, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. Now, wouldn't you want to know what Paul knows? Wouldn't you like to be that sure? So how do we get that certainty? How does one know that God works in everything for good? Well, calm reading of the context shows us that Paul does not say this lightly. In the previous verses, we are reminded of the fragile frame we have. Just like in Psalm 103. Verse 20 of the chapter, the creation is subjected to futility. Verse 22, we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. Verse 23, not only the creation, but we ourselves groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. Well, that doesn't sound that positive. Not at all. If you read that, you have the impression that an exhausting frustration seems to paralyze everything. Everything is exhausted. Life is fragile. What seems so promising becomes a terrifying thing. That's what we've experienced in all its starkness this past Monday morning. So how then does the apostle get to, to the certainty of our text? He says we know the one, but we also know the other. How does he get there? Well, it's because the apostle has said a little bit more. He explained in his letter that sin ruled in the world from Adam on. That, is the, that the reward of sin is death, that the reward of sin is the brokenness of life, and the fragility of man is by sin more than ever a fact. But the apostle has done more than observing sin and its devastating effects. He has also shown that Christ came in this world to rectify things. He came to fulfill the plan of God's redemption. So over against sin, there is the forgiveness of sin. We know about sin, we know about forgiveness, Paul factually says. Over against the consequence of sin, he says, there's the perfecting work through the Holy Spirit. And that is how the apostle can state that in everything that is groaning, you hear more. You hear the sound of the hope for something better. The groaning is indicating that this time is an interim time. We don't see all that is to come. We only know about it. We don't see 
the redemption of our bodies and souls before our very eyes. But we see that there, someone is working on it because Christ came. And he went through death. And he came to his resurrection. In him death was stopped. In him life has started. These facts cannot be denied, especially well, we're on this Saturday, right between Good Friday and Resurrection. We're going to be standing at a grave, but we may think of another grave where the Lord Jesus went to defeat death. And that makes the Apostle certain, even more as he has been a witness of the outpouring of the Spirit. And the teaching of Christ about the Spirit was that the Spirit would dwell in God's children to make them long even more to leaving all that groaning and difficulty behind. These facts, the work of Christ, and the gifts of the Spirit show clearly that God indeed works for our good. For if he had not done this, there was no guarantee. But now there is. Christ is indeed the firstborn from the dead. He is the promise of a new future in which the, the life with God will be there completely and perfectly. In Christ, the apostle finds the evidence. In Christ, he finds the certainty. In Christ, he finds the guarantee. And we can live by that evidence. We can embrace that certainty. We can draw hope from that guarantee. We have the testimony of the witnesses that Jesus Christ was on earth. We have the eyewitness report that he died and that he was raised on the third day. We have an eyewitness report that the Spirit was poured out. And all that tells us that God is indeed omnipresent, but also omnipotent. He is all-powerful. Now, we're not sure about how we will get to that splendid future of perfection. But we know that we will get there. God will finish the job. For God made a promise to each and every one of us. He said this. I will provide you with all good and avert all evil or turn it to your benefit. And God told us, you need that. Because this life is no more than a constant death. And God says, I'll get you there. To the perfect fellowship with me, without spot or wrinkle, in the assembly of the elects. That was promised to Brian as well. Baptized on March 2nd, 1986, in this Coldwell Community Reform Church, Brian was told that he belongs, both with body and soul, both in life and death, to his faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, who has fully paid for all his sins and has set him free from all the power of the devil. Brian heard that without the will of his Heavenly Father, not a hair would fall from his head indeed, that all things would work together for his salvation. Brian heard that the Holy Spirit assures him of eternal life and makes him heartily ready and willing from now on to live for him. Now, Brian got to understand that. As he grew up, he learned how the Lord had loved him already. And Brian came to say it before many witnesses that he loved the Lord. And so it came together, as the Apostle says. We heard, we know, those who love God. All things work together for good. I'm called according to His purpose. I belong to my faithful Savior. My sins are paid for. He loves me. He takes care of me. And what that means, we know, as we have the faith. With the knowledge of the faith, we live and die. With the confidence of the faith, we are comforted. 
Not that we know all things already. Not that we understand why this had to happen in this way. But we do know that God works for good in all things. Not just the sweet things of life, but also the bitter things. Not just the understandable things of life, but also the inexplicable things of life. Not just the bright sunny days, but also the dark valleys that we go through. In all things, God works for good. God has a splendid future in mind. He is working on it. God reaches that right through all the misery and sorrow of this time and age. He works straight ahead toward his goal. We can be assured that he can even use our grief like he did with his child, Job. Like he did with the childless Hannah, the mother of Samuel. Like he did with a man like Paul, when he used his awful past for good. Like he does now for us. Right through our tears and grief. That is the comfort we have. That in everything, God works for good. As we say, he is strong to save. It's the comfort of Lord's Day 9. God knows what he's doing. He has his goal. He's working on it. Nothing can his power withstand. None can pluck them from his hands. For those who love him, God works all things for good. That is his promise for us. That is his work in and for us. That is our comfort as we are called according to his purpose. Now, to reach God's purpose comes at different times and in different ways. And so we must conclude, as paradoxical as it may sound, that one here is better off. Brian is ahead of us. Like King David says of the child that dies, I shall go to him, but he will not return to me. Brian is happy in God's precious love. Brian cannot stray anymore. Brian is taken care of. God fulfilled his purpose for Brian, as we sing in Psalm 138. Now, God told us. God taught us. And God takes us. That is our comfort. And that is how God works in everything for our good. And thus we shall go on in faith. For we know that God has proven again that he reaches his goal with those who are called according to his purpose. And you know how that works. For it is the Spirit who helps us in our weaknesses. We do not know how to pray. We don't know how to think. But he will make us think of God's faithfulness. We don't know how to talk. But he will make us talk about the glorious ways of God. We don't know how to act. But he will enable us to do the good works. We are sure that our God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. I just quoted Philippians 4.19. Of course, God will supply whatever you need. He has made up his mind about you. He will gather unto himself all those whom he called. God has done so much already for it. He gave his son. He gave his spirit. We're on the way. But the road to God's end is through times that we feel the futility to which everything is subjected. And that can make you feel 
completely miserable. But remember this. If the death of God's Son caused your life, what then shall his life do for you other than causing eternal joy? Although we grieve, God worked out eternal salvation. Although we know that we're traveling through the valley of the shadow of that which is no more than a constant death, we know that we'll be translated into constant life, the complete salvation of body and soul. And that is why we say, the Lord gave, the Lord has taken. And we say, blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. I'd like you to turn with me back to the program so that we together can sing when peace like a river, as you find it on the song sheet.
I would like to call on Maria, the representative of the family, to speak to us precious words of eulogy. I would like to say thank you to everybody here. Um, a really difficult time with my family. Um, my name is Marita Riesler, and I was Brian's older sister. Up here with me is my younger sister, Marley, um, and she was Brian's little, well, she is the baby of the family, Brian's little sister. I like to share some insights and some um, some life events from Brian and just maybe a little patience with me as I'm a lot shaky than I thought I would be. My little brother Brian, he was born February 18th, 1986. He was the New Year's baby. And if you didn't hear that right, February 18th and he was the New Year's baby. When he was old enough to understand what that meant, he always teased us about it, how he was so special. He was in the newspaper and he received lots of gifts because he was the New Year's baby. But as my mom would say, it was pretty close because there was a few babies right after him. He was the, the fourth in our family. We have our older brother, Louis, and then it was myself and Sebastian, and then Brian was born. We, we were really interested in this new addition to our family. And, you know, the first couple of years trying to figure out how is this little guy going to fit in here? Was he really one of us or was he kind of different? He had a little bit of a rough start to his life as he had pneumonia several times. Um, but that that was over as he grew up and he became healthier and stronger every day. We were living on the dairy farm when he was born in the first few years and then eventually we had moved from the dairy farm onto the chicken farm and he was special because he got to go to Disneyland with my parents before the big move and it was something that he had always cherished. It was a special trip with my parents. When we had moved on to the chicken farm, it was the perfect age for all of us. We were just right in the thick of things, getting into trouble, and we took Brian with us all the time. My dad was certain that Brian was not the troublemaker. And at the time, we tried to convince my dad, yeah, yes, Brian is the troublemaker, just like us. But really, when he was, we were all growing up, we knew Brian was really the innocent one. He always just went along with us. There was a time when my mom and my dad came home after being in the barns and Sebastian and Brian, he, they had this fantastic idea of setting up a skating rink in the house. And to me, it was really funny. And at the time, it wasn't so funny for my mom uh, but it was fantastic. They had a mixture of sugar and flour. They put it all over the floor. And he was just having the best time, Sebastian, both Sebastian and Brian, just skating across the floor. It was wonderful. And eventually, Brian was the one that had to try things out with scissors 
figure out if he had a knack for hairdressing and gave my lovely sister here a wonderful new hairdo. In which, when I went to the grocery store, I got called a boy in a girl's dress, and I have yet to live it down. <sighs> Eventually, also, um, at that, during that time, we also got our first Nintendo. And when you're young, you don't really think too much of the different skills each other has. But now that I'm grown up and I have my own children, and I think my kids are pretty smart, I'm actually really impressed at the skills that my brother had with that first Nintendo because he was really good and he was so young when he first learned how to play it. This was also the time that we convinced Brian it was a good idea to flush cars down the toilet. Again, my parents not too impressed, and we tried to pin the blame completely on Brian. He did it on his own. There was no influence from us. But as it would be, one of us was, had recorded the entire incident with my dad's new video camera, so there was actually video evidence. <laughs> So we knew it wasn't Brian. Brian just wanted to be part of us, and he wanted to, um, he wanted to make us happy. And my dad always knew Brian was always the innocent one. He always wanted to make us happy. He always wanted to support us. Later, Brian started kindergarten back in 1992, and our mom was his very first school teacher. So that was pretty special between the two of them. And eventually we moved again and we became town people. Brian had a few really key friends. Um, he was really good friends with uh, Jason Wheelinga and Justin Gunsicool. Jason was over a lot and he had so much fun. You only really find a friend like that maybe once or twice in your lifetime. It was then the boys took over the basement and they really became close. Sebastian and Brian really started doing a lot together and it was really like the boys all the time. As a girl, I was pretty excluded from that club, but I did have my sister, so that was good. Um, and at this time, Brian really started to become more and more his own person and his personality really started to come out. Brian was doing well in school. He really focused on what he had to get done. And his gift of writing was very apparent when in grade four at nine years old, he wrote a short poem that was published in a book called Friends, Animals, and Rainbows. And his poem goes like this. It is titled, Hi. Hi, here and there, I like everyone except for girls. I'd wish they'd say something more than hi, like, yo, hey, come here. So I think I'll just stick with hi. He was really proud of that, and it was really one of the first instances that really showed his gift in writing and how much he really loved English. Eventually, we continued to move, to move around a little bit more, and um, again, Sebastian and Brian really started to bond. They had, at one time, come together with a plan and decided that they were going to lock the babysitter outside the house. So it was a fond memory for Sebastian, and we know Brian was innocent in this, of course. <laughs> Sebastian was always the troublemaker. And yes, I do get to throw Sebastian under the bus he said that I could. <laughs> As we grew up, Brian uh, eventually started getting into football. He joined the local football team, the Golden Bears, and he also won a trophy for best offensive lineman. He was quiet and he hung out with his brothers a lot. He was a little bit different than us. He was more calm and reserved. He liked things orderly. He didn't really like chaos a lot, 
So that really made him different than his older siblings, maybe even his younger sibling. He was very steady and reliable. He also developed really quick wit, and he was really good with one-liners. Our family suppers became legendary, as he was really snappy and quick. And at times, it, came, it was almost a contest to see if we could get mom to tip over in laughter, where she would laugh so hard she wouldn't make any noise anymore, and she had tears coming down her face. I don't remember all the jokes, but I do remember that that's where we would stop, was when mom was in tears. Eventually, Brian graduated from Coldwell Christian School, and he had a full-time job afterwards. His steadiness and reliability really started to come through. He was dependable, and you could always rely on him. And when Brian became committed to something, he really stuck with it, and he put his full effort in. When Brian went to university, he really stuck with it, and he put everything in. He gained an English degree and eventually his teaching degree. He would often also tell us stories about things that happened while he was working, and he was quite a gifted storyteller. He, was, he had an easy, laid-back approach to his stories, and he was always able to incorporate some humor. It really made you interested in what he had to say. Brian also became very interested in Japan and Chinese culture. He learned so much, and he made some incredible memories with his two trips to Japan. And if you notice on the slideshow, you can really see how happy he was when he went on those trips. And over time, Brian really became our family anchor. He was reliable and honest. He was always there for my parents. His brothers could rely on him when they needed a ride home at 2 a.m. Granted, he wasn't very happy, but he did it because he was always there for us. And he also was there to help settle little disputes. Maybe we remembered something wrong Maybe we had an argument over what gift to give my mom and dad for their anniversary or their birthdays, and he was there to settle those disputes. He looked after our mom and dad, and it was comforting to know that he was there every day. And it's not something that we often think about, and maybe something we take for granted. So I'll really miss being able to reach out to him just to see how things are going down here. I was really proud of him when mom told me how well he was doing as a teacher. And you can tell that my mom, she was really proud. Teaching was her life. And to see one of her kids really grow and be a good teacher right in front of her, she was just ecstatic about that. And she told me all about it. He was really invested in teaching and helping his students learn and grow. I don't know this personally, but from all the stories that I have heard from everybody talk about my brother, this is what I have heard the most. He was invested in his teaching career, and he really cared for his students. He really wanted them to learn and to grow and to be the best that they could be. And I think one of the very special things about Brian was that Brian had the ability to listen without judgment and it made you want to open up to him. He could be your friend. He was there and reliable. He would, wasn't really surprised by anything. Maybe it was because he grew up with us. But he had a very good gift of listening and being steady. And although he was a quiet guy and he kept a lot to himself, he was very close to his brother Sebastian his whole life. And he was really there for my sister, helping to look after her kids. He regularly spent time, and he supported his nephews and, and his nieces. I know that he has some nephews here who are just absolutely devastated by the loss. We will miss Brian a lot. My parents will miss him every day. 
is he won't be there to do the things that he normally would do. He'll be missed by his close siblings and all of us. We will miss the great conversations. We'll miss the time and trips spent together. We'll miss how he came to all the family events and he brought his wit and humor and made things very lighthearted. And I'm sorry to say it, but my siblings are just not that funny. It was Brian who really had that gift. And I know that his community, the school and his students will miss him just as much as well. And I would also like to extend out a message from our family that we would like to thank our extended family members, um, children, grandchildren, brothers and sisters, the church members, school, and also other churches that have provided us with prayers and abundance of gifts of food and baking, prayers, texts, emails, calls, and visits. It's all been appreciated so very much. Many of our family in the Netherlands may also be following this by live stream, and we would also like to thank them for joining us. We'd like to thank you all from all of us, where in times like this, we realize that many people that have been impacted directly and indirectly by Brian during his life and now by passing away at such a young age. We have the comfort that he is with his Lord and Savior. His journey has been completed in this world. It is just difficult for us who are left behind as there's no way that she can actually replace such a caring and wonderful person. Thank you all for being here. Um, as you guys heard, my brother is a really gifted writer, was a really gifted writer, and um, I took this week to process by writing a piece for him, and I thought that I would share that with you um, right now. Sometimes in life, I find that I can go a long time thinking I have a good understanding of something, only that for that to be shattered when confronted with its absence. I start to know my satiation deeply when hunger creeps in. The summer sun warms my insides like a bowl of Sunday soup when I notice the January chill. Alone in the darkness, fighting my mind's anxious thoughts, I begin to learn of light's secret gifts. Today I grieve you, dear brother, but now I intimately know you. Just as the tides grasp the moon, I whisper my goodbyes to a body, a body that was born of dust and returns to dust, but the soul, is now together with our maker. And since it is no longer here, I can put thought and awareness to what it felt like when those humble eyes looked at me. It feels weighty to describe a soul, truly ineffable, but if I had to put a few words to it, I would say this. You feel like a joy that is uncontrollable, similar to children on the last day of school, romping through dry prairie grass, outstretched arms, backpacks flying. You feel like a beautiful novel that whispers its secret knowledge in your ear, but only if you read thoughtfully. You feel mischievous, like a wise owl that reads your inner thoughts, looking for truth, turning away when met with dishonesty. I hold sorrow in my arms like an unruly toddler, threatening to bounce out at a moment's opportunity because I am confronted with the absence of God. Even though I have humanly pain, I can begin to celebrate that I had the chance to truly meet his soul, the part of him that is God-breathed. Now, when I think of my dear brother Brian, I may feel my Lord's presence, and he may give me strength to deal with this hard day and all the hard days to come. Thank you both, Marita and Marley, for giving us a beautiful picture in words. We are grateful for you sharing these memories with us. We are, at this point in time, also uh, inviting up principal of the school on behalf of the school community, Brother Jeff and Rotti.
Um, thank you to the family as well for uh, giving me this opportunity, inviting me to say a few words, and I will say a few. I learned this past week that uh, this is a lot harder than uh, I ever imagined it would be. I first met Brian about 25 years ago in the fall of 1999, say last century. Brian was a grade 8 student at Coldwell Christian School, and I was in my very first year of teaching. If anyone would have told Brian or myself that 25 years later, Brian would be my colleague and the high school English teacher here, neither of us would have believed it. Let's just say that as a young teenager, education was not Brian's top priority. He did like to have a lot of fun. It was that same year that I also met Faye. She was the teacher at the time, and she and I have worked together basically ever since. I have enormous respect for Faye and the energy and passion she has for teaching Covenant children. Faye was so proud, as the sisters have just said, so proud of Brian for completing his teaching degree and that she was able to teach in the same school as her son. Over the past two years, however, is when I really got to know Brian as his principal. Every first year teacher can attest to the challenges of starting off in this profession. And I personally believe that English teachers might have it the hardest. There's so much marking, so much content to navigate, and add to that the pressures of, in his case, a diploma exam at the end of the year, and expectations of parents and students, and it's a recipe for a challenging year. Brian handled these challenges with professionalism and grace. We talked almost daily about how things were going, and he often asked for advice on the things he wanted to do in class. He was always willing to meet with students and help them with their writing, and his door was always open to parents as well. My caution often to Brian was uh, to slow down. Uh, as I think his sisters allude to this as well, that everything he did, he did to the fullest, to 110%. And my worry as principal was burning him out. He worked, I don't think there's a teacher that could, uh, that could work harder than he did. Uh, he put his everything into his job. Getting to know Brian personally and professionally over the past two years makes his passing very difficult to deal with. I had a front row seat to observe his growth as a person, as a teacher, and most importantly, as a child of God. As a colleague, I was looking forward to seeing him continue that growth, and we often discussed what was working and what he wanted to change for next year. To have it come to such an abrupt end is incredibly hard. And I can only imagine the pain and emptiness that this leaves for his family and specifically for his parents who have shared their home with Brian for 38 years. That all being said, we are not a people who have to live in sorrow. God will never give us more than we can handle and his grace is indeed sufficient for us. Brian's work on earth and specifically at Coldwell Christian School is finished. He is now in heaven with his Savior, where there is no more sickness, sadness, or weakness. May we all take comfort in the knowledge of a faithful Savior who promised that he was going to prepare a place for all those who believe. And may we look forward to his return on the clouds of heaven when he will bring us to be with him. This past week when the staff met together, we read from John 11 about the death of Lazarus. I'd like to conclude with these words from the Lord Jesus to Martha. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Thank you. Thank you, Jeff, for sharing also how the school community has experienced the last couple of years with Brian and also the last moments and now here we are. Going forward, we can only do in the strength of the Lord. And we know how to get connected. We can pray. Why don't we Unite in prayer and ask the Lord to bless us going forward. Almighty, gracious God, how good it is to have your word 
to guide us in all things of life, also in times such as these. As we go through the highs and lows of our emotions, we find rest in our faith. We thank you that we can share and continue to share all good things, good memories, good experiences, work situations, home situations, family situations, situations of friendship, and that in all these things we may see a constant your care, your love, your provision for all your people, also for Brian. We thank you that you worked it out in his life, that he continued to be strengthened by the faith that you gave him, that he could live by the conviction that all is well for those who belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray that we may have that same certainty that through our grief and tears we have the peace of Christ which transcends all understanding. We pray that you will confirm and impress upon our hearts that blessed are those who die in the Lord for their works will follow them. Grant that we all may be blessed with that conviction that our works are not in vain. And so, Lord God, we pray that going forward in this day, we may be blessed by you with strength from above. In short order, we will go to the cemetery where we will sow the seed of the body. As we do so, we will once again experience how conclusive that is. It marks the end of a life in the body. But we pray that we not only may look at what is before us, but that we all may look beyond the grave to the one who rose from the grave and gives us the strength to look forward to the day. That the grave will be opened and the trumpet shall sound when all those that went into the grave will be raised up. We pray that we all may be witnesses of that glorious union of body and soul restored and fully perfect, ready for eternal fellowship and joy. In the meantime, Lord, we pray for the family, for Ben and Faye, for the siblings, for the nieces and nephews, for all of us, that we going forward may not fall back but progress on the way that you set out for us. Bless us then with comfort and strength. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I will invite you to rise and sing, Great is thy faithfulness.
please, if you so desire, follow the family when we make our way to the cemetery. <laughs>